Everyone, welcome uh, to the, um, one of the webinar uh, events from the Innovation Value Institute um, here at Manuf University. My name is Marcus Helfert. I'm a professor in digital service innovation at Manuf University, and I'm also the director of the Innovation Value Institute. Uh, and it's a pleasure to me to uh, introduce uh, another event uh, around the, the webinar series. Um, us. And this time today we have an exciting topic, I think, uh, around smart regions, um, <coughs> how digitalization uh, can help to revive, to boost, uh, to make rural areas, rural economies vibrant again. Um, so when we put uh, the, the, um, the uh, program together for today's webinar, we thought this is a really good uh, topic as well, where we can show how digital, digitalization have direct benefits to uh, citizens, to societies, uh, and particularly in this case to, to rural areas. So I'm really excited about uh, the three presentations what we have. Um, so uh, we will introduce the, 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 the speakers then over time, uh, but maybe first, uh, so we will, this time we will actually have two facilitators uh, for the webinar. So I'm joined as well with my colleague, uh, Sore, a little bit probably about the background, um, how we got to this. Uh, so we also worked on a, on a bigger topic, a bigger proposal within the, in the EU context around this. Um, over the last couple of weeks. So, uh, and I think Ireland has a fantastic uh, ecosystem, a fantastic uh, network uh, around that with um, making um, uh, the, the regions more vibrant uh, again. And so I, I just kind of before um, uh, the, the, the webinar, I thought it might be also interesting kind of the key statements, what we actually uh, summarized mm -hmm. or what the, that proposal, that EU proposal motivated. And when I read these policies, these EU policies and the, the statements around that and the need for something like digitalization of rural areas, that basically rural areas are 28% of the population of the territory in the EU. So it's a large part of the, the EU. And however, basically the GDP, uh, so the income in these rural areas are much lower than the average. So there's somewhere a disconnect between the importance of rural areas and actually the income uh, generation uh, around it. And when we think about um, uh, what like particular dominant or economic factors around agriculture, uh, tourism, sustainable tourism, they have a significant part of the GDP uh, contributions. However, somewhere it doesn't arrive in the rural area. And I think digitalization can help uh, to do uh, something uh, to revive that. Um, so I, I like, uh, uh, I, I'm not a specialist in agriculture or in, in um, sustainable tourism, but I found an uh, interesting statement that 25% of farms disappeared uh, over the last 10 years. So this is just uh, really significant. And that also the value share dropped from 30% to 24% in, in, in the rural areas. And, and then the, the two other really astonishing figures is basically that 70% of the agrochemical industry is dominated by two or three companies. So they basically are very monopolized. And uh, the food retailers, uh, uh, five, uh, uh, five largest food retailers uh, have the market share of 60%. So there's really a big disconnect between kind of economic gain and importance and population around the rural area. That's why I'm looking so forward to this uh, session today and the discussion around that. And we have, uh, I think, three fantastic speakers uh, here lined up um, and, and sharing the insights uh, ar uh, around their experience, their expertise and uh, projects around that. So um, uh, you see probably the slides um, <laughs> with the agenda. So um, we have Beatrice Hennigan from Mayo County Council here, Head of Information Systems and Innovation, uh, Professor William Heinz um, uh, from uh, Future Analytics Consulting, so the Managing Director of Future Analytics Consulting, uh, are also interesting um, uh, projects um, uh, around that. Uh, and then Michal Ohanik, uh, I hope I pronounced that correct, but um, so uh, from the digital 
uh, network in the Goldtag uh, area. So uh, um, with the, the digital hub, so all the exciting projects and I'm really looking forward to all the three uh, presentations. And I think I need to stop now because otherwise the time is running and uh, talking a lot about rural areas, but we are here for the three speakers um, uh, uh, around that. And then uh, on the end from um, shortly after three o'clock, a panel discussion. Um, uh, around the topic. So if you have questions during the, the, the presentations, feel free to add them here to the um, uh, question and answer session. So we will go back to that in that uh, panel discussion question and answer session. So um, uh, it's good to, to write them down, to share them, and then we can go back to the individual speakers around that. And then from 3.30 on, there's a network of opportunities with different sessions uh, uh, around that. Uh, so Beatrice is the Head of Information Systems and Innovation uh, at the Mayo County Council uh, and um, so leading innovation projects, uh, engagement and particular around the IT architecture and uh, the, 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 the various initiatives to actually use digitalization for the benefit uh, of Mayo uh, County Council. So, um, and I hand over to Beatrice um, uh, and uh, her presentation at this stage. So I stop the sharing of it and then we can hand over to Beatrice for the presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, Marcus. So um, I was ready here to share. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so I think we're all going to become television experts from um, being so so used to video video conferencing. Um, but but thank you very much for the opportunity to to speak. Uh, I think um, hopefully part of what I have to talk about will have a relevance, uh, particularly from that regional and you know rural digital outlook. And from Mayo's point of view, also looking very much at a, a global global out, outlook. So. Uh, take you through the presentation, hopefully about 15 minutes. Um, I have a nice video at the end. Uh, it may or may not work, but, but we'll give it a shot. Um, so just to overview what it is that I'd be speaking about. So I'll be looking at a context of the population and demographics initially, just to uh, provide you with that, with that context. And then looking at our digital ecosystem uh, from the local and regional, from the national, and from the global perspectives. Yeah, uh, first, my apologies. There are some production here. Yeah. And hope Thanks you can that. hear can me hear now. Sora uh, coming in there. I think that maybe there's a delay on that, but I keep going. Uh, so from the point of view of uh, just some other statistics, just adding to some of the items that Marcus had spoken about there, uh, when we look at what, what we're referring to here in this particular slide as Ireland's Smart Atlantic Way, we're looking at a population from Donegal down to Clare, uh, including Roscommon and Leitrim. Uh, of a population of about 1 million people. And what, what we hope to see is, is a good counterbalance to the east coast of Ireland from a, from a, you know, a digital, from a, an industry, from a, an enterprise perspective. Um, you can see there, these numbers are from the last census, from the 2016 census. And sorry, now it just went ahead of me there. Um, so you can see that Mayo is one of the the only counties to actually have decreased in population. So, you know, in spite of everything we've been going through recently, it, perhaps there are some, some advantages and, and some opportunities that will come out of uh, the, the awful crisis that, that we've been through and that we're still going through. And we can certainly see from the point of view of digitization and collaboration that it has really equalized the playing field from the point of view of geography. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see how things go in that regard. And again, uh, just coming back to the, the numbers and the statistics from the point of view of rural populations, and you can see there that the, the red, the red uh, counties, not red states, those red counties there, we're looking at areas that have a rural population in excess of 60%, and most of the, the counties along the western seaboard fall into that category, with the exception there of Sligo and Clare. Um, so they are predominantly rural populations with some some large towns uh, interspersed in the middle. So again, what I, I'd like to focus on is uh, the smart regions and ecosystems from the West of Ireland context. Uh, so we'll be looking at locally, you know, what, what we do in the council, 
uh, regionally. We have a lot of great initiatives in, in regionally in the west of Ireland. What we do nationally, you know, and I think we have very good engagement na nationally, and, and we have a good global perspective. Um, Mayo uh, has over 3.5 million people globally that associate themselves with, with being having a connection with, with Mayo. So that's something that we, we have greatly leveraged, um, particularly our communications department in Mayo County Council have done great work in that regard. Uh, so just moving on to the next slide, you know, and if we look at things from the perspective of the, the smart domains, you know, and these are often associated with, with the city and the smart city perspective, um, this particular group of uh, services and, and uh, domains is actually from the TM Forum um, uh, framework and really a lot of these same domains map to the rural environment as much as they do to the city uh, perhaps with the difference of how we look at our places and spaces but everything else has a very much has a relevance and there are areas that guide us when we think about our, our smart cities and smart communities and smart uh, rural areas as well so smart mail um, sorry about that now just very sensitive mouse here. Uh, so Smart Mayo, you know, our, our, our vision in Mayo for, is for a county that is sustainable, inclusive, prosperous, and proud. And, and that is a, a mantra that, that we try to live by. And, um, you know, we have a fantastic team in Mayo County Council and colleagues that I've actually liaised with in, in preparing this presentation. So we have a head of Marine, we have a broadband officer. Like I said, we have fantastic communications. So, that that mini ecosystem in itself uh, brings a great value uh, you know for, uh, and becomes a great um kind of a, an integrated environment for a lot of the things that that we do regionally so from a, a local imperative uh, perspective when we think about what it is that we do within mayo county council and you know we think to be able to do the things we do outside of the council we need to enable ourselves digitally so i'd like to think that we think strategically we, we listen to our data you know, we, we see our data and the value of data as being very important. Our core value is of citizen first, and we work from a foundation of IT governance. And the enablers in that regard, you know, we, we have a platform-based approach to how we do business. Um, so whether that be our, our online platform to include our website, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, building our capabilities, and you know, that includes our platforms, our, our skills, our people, most importantly. And we have adopted a cloud first strategy, um, which has greatly enabled us in, in recent times. So we've had, we've been on the Microsoft uh, cloud platform for over three years and we're, we're quite ready to adapt. You know, we had 400 users up and running um, on their working from home when, when the crisis hit. So we were quite well enabled to, to take, you know, to take that forward. And from a regional point of view, there, you know, obviously the local authorities are, are often the lead agency in a lot of the collaboration, but, but there are some, some very good regional strategy and technical, technical groups. So myself, I'm, I'm part of a regional network of um, heads of information systems from Donegal down to Clare. And we work then closely with the Western Development Commission, um, the Enterprise Hubs Network, uh, DigiWest, which uh, has hubs uh, interspersed throughout the the West region um, from Donegal, Sligo, Mayo, Roscommon. Mm -hmm. And then a recent recent initiative is the Smart Atlantic Way, uh, which again is trying to bring that digital perspective uh, to what we're doing and, and join things up, you know, be, beyond the economic and so forth and put a digital emphasis on things that we're looking at. So from a national point of view, as Marcus men mentioned there, I'm, I am involved in an architecture and standards group, so I chair that nationally. And our remit is to look at ways that we can bring in a, well, look at things from an enterprise architecture point I'm of view. I'm sorry, can everybody else hear Beatrice? Because I, I, I've lost um, sounds there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I uh, can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you, Beatrice, perfect. Okay, right, I'm, I'm for, my beam holds, unfortunately, yep. I uh, keep going. So, um, so like I say, from, from a national perspective, we're looking at that architecture and standards group, which I chair, um, looking at an enterprise architecture approach to how we do our systems nationally. So while we'd have a certain local remit, you know, a, a huge local remit, um, but also there are systems that are, have a national implication. So our planning systems, our housing systems, our library systems, 
Um, so our role and as part of the architecture and standards group is to look at a standards based approach and to evaluate when new projects are coming on stream um, that they're they're brought in from the point of view of the standards. Um, we have, uh, I suppose, a very good example of that is work that's being done nationally on the service catalogue project. And that service catalogue, the idea of that is that every local authority, all 31 of us in the country, have the same set of services. Now, there may be some services that aren't applicable to a, an inland county that are to a, a marine county, but invariably 90% of our services should be standard. So uh, that, I suppose, is our, our building block uh, standard for, for the sector, uh, just as an example of that. Um, we see principles as a cornerstone of a lot of what we do and principles from a, an architecture and enterprise architecture point of view. And on that, we're, we're actually working with Maynooth University. So we do very much embrace that quadruple helix model and uh, been fortunate enough to work with Marcus and Zora um, who've been doing research with us uh, to validate a set of principles which will become um, the standard set of principles for, for the sector um, from the point of view of, of what we're doing with those national systems. So again, looking at some of those uh, smart domains, um, citizen engagement, some of the areas that, that we're working on there, um, we've just, uh, just about to launch a citizen engagement platform called Open Consult. Uh, so the idea of that will be that when we're doing our county development plan or our climate adaptation plan or any of those um, any of those initiatives where we look for citizen engagement, that people will be able to engage in, in this very uh, structured and, and organized online platform. So that, that's about to go live. Um, I suppose traditionally the, the council, while, while we, all, we all know we don't have a, an, an e-voter system as such, we, we all know what happened with that particular project, but, but there is actually quite a bit of digitization around um, our democracy side here. things. Is, is so we you, have um, you, you can't hear Beatrice the e-reg no. uh, e-votary system. So um, these are uh, where Horace, people register um, to vote and how we manage you that. Can you check down there on the left? Um, the uh, e-count system that's actually used during the election. So that actually the does bottom. quite a bit of the so calculating behind the scenes in spite of all those paper votes and um, everything else that so you see. If you click on the little arrow, you should be able to choose. So um, another very exciting which, uh, initiative that, that we're working on at the moment is our new mail.ie website and our new website is about to go live um, that, in the uh, next couple of weeks. And what we've done uh, with this, um, for, we've for brought together our old Mayo Coco, Mayo um, County Council site, and our more brochure tourist-based um, Mayo.ie. So yeah. those sites have now come together have, um, in a single Mayo.ie, which we're about to go live with in the next couple of weeks, and it'll be officially launched then later in the summer. Um, but the, the project for that was awarded to a Belfast-based company called Zesty. And uh, yeah, that's the RFP system company system that did the Wild Atlantic Way project as well. So, so you can see there's a, it's quite a, a beautiful looking site. So uh, hopefully you'll all have a chance to look at that in the coming okay. weeks. You got it there. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Okay, so from the point of view then of economy and, and innovation, again, looking at, at that particular domain, um, we have our local enterprise office, which is a, a driver and supporter of local businesses, SMEs in particular in the area. Uh, recently, we launched uh, the COVID-19 Restart Fund where small businesses could apply for up to €10,000 in support grant to help them get back on, you know, get their businesses back up and running. And uh, this, this amount was actually based on rates paid last year. But I think to date, we've had about 1,300 applicants for that particular grant. And then another initiative that we've been working on is a, a search facility, a, a website um, through the Atlantic Economic Corridor um, platform. And every lo local authority along the Western Seaboard has an AEC officer. And this particular project is designed to allow any prospect prospective um, business that might be looking to come into the West of Ireland and set up shop uh, to be able to do a search uh, to find whether it be a site, a greenfield site, or uh, somewhere that's been zoned for industrial or office space. Um, so, so that search is available and with parameters such as uh, size and location and proximity and cluster information and that type of thing. Our places and spaces, I, I don't know if any of you have, have had the, the pleasure of, of cycling along or, or walking along the Greenway, which goes from Westport to Ackle, um, digitally enabled, or you know maybe that's one of those things where you want to leave the 
the digitization at home, but but yes, there there are smart aspects to that as well. Um, of course, on the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, in 2019, we opened the Loch Lana Leisure Centre in Castlebar, a state-of-the-art facility. And as part of that facility, um, we uh, put in high fibre uh, connections to it, which in turn linked back into the Loch Lana Conference Centre located right behind the, uh, the leisure complex. Um, and also uh, allowed us to facilitate some of the Wi-Fi for EU connections, which I'll talk a little bit more about now. So the Wi-Fi for EU project is uh, it's to enable free Wi-Fi access in public places such as on our main streets, our parks, museums. Um, most uh, local authorities in the country applied for funding under that and Mayo uh, did as well and, and we, we obtained €120,000 in funding, half from the European funding and half from the Department of Rural and Community Affairs or Development. So nine towns and villages were selected, uh, interspersed, you know, spread out geographically throughout the county. You can see them there on the map. Um, so so there, some of them are up and running already. Um, and those that aren't are soon to go live with that particular project. And then the National Broadband Plan, uh, I suppose a place like Mayo, that, that, that is something that is particularly important to us. And there are certainly rural areas that, that don't have the, the level of broadband that they could do with. Um, so um, you might be aware that the, the National Broadband Plan uh, was awarded to National Broadband Ireland in November. The contract was awarded and it's uh, to provide high speed broadband to rural Ireland on a phase basis. So the spend in Mayo is going to be 145 million and the goal of uh, you know, an enabling fast broadband for 44% of, of the premises in Mayo. And another aspect of the broadband plan, which is already underway, is the broadband connection points. Um, so these are public locations throughout the county, uh, such as uh, community centres. Um, you know, they can be any public location, really. Primarily, they have been community centres, but uh, you can see there, one of them is an old guard station. Um, so again, like the Wi-Fi for EU, a lot of these um, connection points are already enabled. And I suppose these have become particularly important. I, I know uh, when you think about students and, and you know, whether they be college students or secondary school students who are perhaps in an area that they don't have good broadband, here's a, a, you know, a situation where we could mitigate that, that challenge for people, you know, where they can come into a local community center. Um, you know, at the moment that, that might be a bit challenging with the social distancing, but, um, but that is, is one of the, the things that will be enabled by this particular initiative. And just another another project that's uh, kind of an interesting one from from a Mayo point of view, and that is the the second uh, Atlantic European connector AC2 on the red line there. Um, it was due to come into Old Head Bay in in uh, Old Head in Two Bay um, around December of last year. It has been delayed, but, but we are hoping that it gets back on track. Um, but this this provides a 7,000 kilometer, kilometer stretch of that. Uh, subsea fiber. Um, the main partners on this particular initiative were Google and Facebook, but there was also capacity on that, um, that cable for, for other businesses. So, um, you know, when, when that is in place, that will again provide an opportunity for that very fast broadband connection and, and enterprises looking for that type of a connection to come into the west of Ireland. Um, you know, like I say, you can see there that it actually around rock Hall, uh, trough, it actually, uh, that's where the junction cuts off and comes down to Cube Bay, but it does provide a highly resilient connection, um, finishing off in Denmark and uh, connecting back in then with the AEC1 to provide um, significant resilience on that, that connection to the United States from Ireland and from Europe. Uh, so it's another very interesting digital initiative for us this year was Mayo Day. Um, every year, and it was a, I suppose a, a thought that evolved in, in Mayo originally, and it's now been taken up by some other local authorities. But on the first Saturday in May every year, we have Mayo Day, and it's uh, it'll have a particular theme. It might be culture, it might be uh, music. Um, but this year, it, it went online, and we had a, a hugely successful Mayo Day where we had Mayo people from all over the world um, perform online and. The event went from for about four hours on on the first Saturday in May and uh, was was very well subscribed to and very well attended and it was was great fun. So again, that that's us reaching out globally 
uh, to the Mayo diaspora and, and this year, like say, in a very digitally enabled format. So what's next for us? Um, so our Mayo digital strategy is uh, due to be prepared and finished by quarter four 2020. There's been a, a consultancy firm uh, awarded a contract to assist with that. We we'll continue to build our, our internal capabilities, uh, whether that be our platforms, our skills, our, our people, uh, and so forth. Um, deliver on the national broadband plan for Mayo. Our, our communication, obviously, a very important part of what we do. So that new Mayo.ie site uh, due to go live in the next several weeks. And look for opportunities then beyond the, you know, the standard IT and looking at the opportunities around digital services, digital workplace delivery, robotic process automation, and there are framework tenders in place nationally for a high transaction based robotic processes. So looking at that type of technology and artificial intelligence. So we're, we're testing a, a chat bot, to see how that will work out on our website um, at the moment. Sorry now, just go back one. And that, that joined up perspective. And um, you know, I think that regionally to, to make sure that, that we collaborate and we continue to do that. And I think we, what we've seen, as I said earlier, from this, this crisis has been an opportunity and it's become in many ways a great equalizer to, you know, to, to allow us who might have had to take the 520 train to Dublin um, to, to take part in, in a lot of different things that we would have done anyway, but now they've just been a lot more convenient for us. Yes, but Beatrice, I was, was just starting with the, the Wild Atlantic Way, like I, I did a tiny bit of it uh, at some stage. Uh, it, it is fantastic and also like the digitalization and the, the, the effort and um, development and all this the, the digitalization about that. This is impressive what you just presented. And also, as you said on the, 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 the later part of the presentation, to now see the other opportunities and also like around uh, digital services, about robotics and also artificial intelligence. So I think we are with the digitalization just at the start of it. So we have provided the foundation, but now actually we can exploit the opportunities around that. And your presentation really provided a, a, a lot of um, uh, um, a point us to, to think about and to kind of where, where, where um, activities happening in that. So thanks, thanks very, very much. And this stage, so we will have the panel and the question um, session after all the three presentations. So again, I would uh, thank, thanks Beatrice for, for that so far. So I would encourage everyone to basically put question and answers, uh, questions into the question and answer session button that's on the bottom. There's Q&A, so if you want to type in uh, questions, then we can go back afterwards in the panel discussion uh, on, on this for the individual speakers or all the panel, basically. Okay, uh, I need to look a little bit, apparently that's my main job uh, today, to look a little bit on the time as well. Uh, I think we don't do that bad, so we kind of just a few minutes late on this, so that is perfect, so, um, and we move on to the second um, a presentation, the second keynote presentation in this webinar, uh, Professor William Heinz, uh, Managing Director from a company called Future Analytics in, in Dublin. Um, and um, William has also a lot of experience around uh, rural area development, uh, digitalization, the analytics side uh, uh, around that, and moving into this topic of uh, smart villages, uh, and the implications and barriers, challenges uh, uh, around that. So I'm really looking forward, uh, William, to your presentation uh, uh, around all of these topics for sustainable growth in these smart villages and um, pointers and, and, and suggestions around that. So we switch now um, the screen again, and hopefully that works now um, with, the, with the sharing of the presentation. So thank you very much, Marcus, and for the opportunity to present to you this afternoon. Um, as Marcus was saying, I'm from a company called Future Analytics Consulting. And uh, so we, we, we have done a lot and are doing a lot of work in the whole area of the rural economy and in the area of what we call here smart villages and linked in with smart technology. So we're looking at the, the, the kind of the opportunities along with the barriers and challenges to enable it enable vibrant rural economies through digitization to really come to life and, you know, uh, really explore and develop these opportunities going forward into the next decades. Um, 
So just just a little bit about ourselves. So so we are um, an SME based in Dublin. Um, we are uh, we're primarily a planning consultancy, uh, an, an economics consultancy, but very much based in um, research, kind of very evidence based research. And, and we do a lot of work and we we work with Marcus um, in the whole space of Horizon 2020 EU funded applied work, which is really enhances our, you know, on the ground, say knowledge and network within the Irish context. And again, everything that we do is housing evidence based um, knowledge. So so data is absolutely key and hence digitization is is very central to um, what, what we do. Um, in just in terms of our experience in what we've been doing in the whole area of the rural economy and town and village um, work. Um, so over the last uh, number of years, we've undertaken a series of what we call town and village health checks. So it's just like it's checking the vibrancy and vitality of towns and really exploring their, um, their opportunities and playing to their strengths going forward to come up with really good um, opportunities and growth um, patterns for them. So we've un undertaken a number of these around the, the country. Um, and also we've looked at regional and town centre profiling. Um, we've worked with um, economic and enterprise development strategies for, for town centres. And you, you may have seen some of the work that we produced. Um, and it's the, the last bullet point, there was a particular project we did for the SESI back in 2018 called Rejuvenation of Ireland's Small Towns, a call to action. And um, that, that that, that got a lot of, say, publicity um, across the country um, in terms of its importance and how rural towns can respond um, to, you know, to overcome barriers and really enhance their opportunities. So that's just, that's just some of the work that, that, we've, that we've been um, undertaking in the last number of years. And I suppose it's very important to uh, understand the, the, the context of what we're, we're dealing with when, we, when we're talking about um, the, the urban economy, the, the, the urban settlement size, etc. And so, but, but setting that in the rural context. So the CSO defined urban areas as settlements with a, a population of greater than 1500. And based on this classification, over a third of the Irish population uh, live in the, the, this, the, in rural areas. And between the two last census, 2011, 2016, the Irish population grew by just under 4%. Um, and the percentage of this growth was in what has been designated as urban areas. So in these 1,500 plus settlements. However, um, th th there's much more to this context than, than just, just looking at the high level statistics. So the standard approach for urban rural classification doesn't address the underlying characteristics which might separate one rural area from another. Um, for example, a rural family living in North County Dublin would have shorter distances, service and amenities than, uh, for example, a rural family living in Roscommon. So the, the, the levels of critical mass and proximity to that critical mass are really important when one is trying to understand this rural urban um, situation and linkage. So in 2019, the CSO produced what is called a six-way classification system. And, and the, the map over there on my right-hand side shows this six-way classification. Um, everything from the, the, the highest level city down to highly rural remote areas. Um, and it, it, like it, it is a workable you know, classification and that, that, that you know, can, can provide, say, a, a commonality of understanding. Um, Within the, um, the rural um, sector of the classification, um, the, there's the three subcategories that you can see there. So it's rural areas with high urban influence, except for example, the example I gave of the North County Dublin family. Rural areas with moderate um, urban influence, again, that could re reflect on say the Roscommon family. And then highly rural remote areas. And, and as we all know, we, we've numbers of those around the country and you can see them classified there in the dark green. So again, it's very important to understand the linkages and relationships between our urban rural settlements. Just in terms of how this population has dispersal has become increasingly unbalanced over the last um, census periods. Um, uh, so again, since, 2000, uh, since 1986, the, the population of what's called the EMRA region, the Eastern Midlands Regional Assembly region, has increased dramatically. You know I mean, 
and leading to this has been the increasing sprawl and the usage of car. Um, again, and the image on, on my right hand side shows the levels of percentage increase in each of the counties um, in the Republic over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and the bars coloured in orange are those counties that have experienced growth levels above the state average, which and the state average being 31% growth over the last 20 years, while those coloured green are the counties that fell below this average. And if you just look at those orange counties, for example, you can really see the dominance of Dublin on the surrounding hinterland where that growth has occurred. If you just look at the likes of uh, Kildare, Longford, Mead, um, uh, Louth, they've all experienced, Wicklow, for example, they've all experienced significant growth. And um, again, just again, influencing the, that are being influenced by that Dublin dominance. And again, going back to Beatrice's point about kind of this balancing, it's very, it's really very important for the a sustainable and resilient um, Ireland. And um, just touching on some of the global trends and implications for Ireland, the rural economy has been faced with many challenges over recent decades, challenges which have been further compounded by global trends, which have impacted on the vitality and viability of our town centres. And th those two words, vitality and viability, they, they are central to the, when you're undertaking a detailed health check for a village or settlement. Um, so the impact of the 2007, 2008 global economic crisis, increasing digitization in the economic activity, uh, increased urbanization, influx of international brands and the proliferation of shopping centers, the rise in ex the experiential shopping. So, so people are, are, are not such going out looking just for, for comparison or convenience food now. They just want other types of experiences such as eating, you know, going for drinks, beauticians, barbers. So all of these have now been built into this experiential shopping experience that one needs to consider um, when, when we, we are, say, looking at the design and layout of our towns and our village settlements. Um, and obviously the impact of the COVID pandemic has, has been pretty dramatic. Um, the evolving challenge for the rural economies and the, the rural assem assemblies, COVID-19 regional uh, economic analysis sought to identify regional and local exposure to COVID related to, and its related impacts. And they found that coastal rural economies are more likely to be exposed due to the reliance on the commercial units that generally require human interaction and cannot be operated remotely. The county with the highest COVID exposure ratio was Kerry with 54% um, of commercial units operating in the sectors were likely worst affected, followed by Westmead, Donegal, Cavan, Clare. So, so this, this coastal rural uh, economy has been very much affected by COVID. The crisis has also highlighted the potential of transformational societal change, huge increases or huge decreases in commuter traffic, a shift to remote working, and that's been really positive. Um, and then the leveraging of COVID uh, economic recovery strategies to, to um, simultaneously um, advance uh, climate change reduction measures and low carbon future presence, a strategic opportunity for us. So there's, there's opportunities around the whole hub type developments. And again, going back to Beatrice's point about the um, Atlantic Economic Corridor, um, there's huge advances going on now in the whole um, development of uh, enterprises, um, enterprise centers, and digital enterprise centers. And these centers have different scales, everything from the work-based um, enterprise center right down to the community-based one um, with, with five classifications in total. And that's going to have huge impacts on, you know, opportunities, remote working, second landing space for companies, etc. So again, having massive impacts on the whole area of climate change. So just touching on some of the barriers to vibrant rural town and village centres, um, these barriers are looking at increased costs and overheads, lack of collaboration, reduced funding for local authorities, governance challenges, legacies out of town shopping centres, unattractive urban realm, dominance of the car, lack of connectivity, failure to innovate, demographic change. So, so these are some of the barriers. And again, this touches back on some of the work that we did for the SESI. Um, so while trends provide indication of the direction, pace and form of the, the changes occurring, interventions can be made to mitigate against, against these, negative, just these negative challenges or these negative barriers. So in order to design appropriate interventions, key barriers must be identified and addressed. 
and a plan-led approach is critical as community ownership um, is of the process. And again, going back to the, to, the, the, to the seven principles set out in the leader program, there's real opportunities here to, you know, to, to really promote those principles, everything from bottom up, collaboration, citizen centric, you know, really important points that need to be kind of giving ownership back to the community to really to lead to, lead to this uh, plan led approach. And um, touching on some of the work that the, that's been done in the EU, particularly around smart villages. So in 2017, um, Europe, Europe, the European Commission launched this EU action for smart villages and it seeks to overcome the digital divide between the rural and urban areas and to develop the potential offer by connecting and digitization of the rural areas. So kind of bringing them onto a par with their ur urban counterparts. Um, so the European Network for Rural Development the, and, the, the, and in particular the thematic group on smart villages was set up in October of 2017. And it sets out the importance of this EU action plan for smart villages. Um, an initial scoping exercise by the uh, European network highlighted that many rural villages are locked into this circle of decline. And you can see that they're over on the, the right hand side, like everything from out migration, leads to low population density, lack of, lack of critical mass, low rate of business creation, fewer jobs. And then it just goes around in this kind of um, circle of decline context by two mutually reinforcing trends. First, a shortage of jobs, um, and sustainable business activity, and secondly, inadequate and declining services. So the smart village concept envisages that traditional and new networks and services are enhanced by means of digital telecommunication technologies, innovations, and better use of knowledge, um, all for the betterment of the inhabitants and the businesses. So really tackling these and bringing these to the fore can break this circle of decline and actually we reverse it into a positive situation. And um, and I suppose it's, it's very important then just to understand what uh, a smart village is. And again, look, looking at the work that's been done by the European Commission under the governance of the European Parliament, smart villages are all about innovative solutions uh, to, to, to make them more resilient. And resilience now is becoming the new buzzword in somewhat replacing sustainability. And resilience is not only about, say, bouncing back to where one was before a, a crisis or an occurrence of a disaster, but it's also about bouncing forward. So it's, it's about learning and going forward. So you, you actually return to a better stage. It's about participatory approach, again, with the citizens. It's about mobilization of solutions offered by the digital technologies and cooperation and alliances within that. And it's about the development of smart village strategies. Like we have um, many, many, many village and town plans. We should have these smart village strategies as well to enhance these plans. So the EC can, concluded that any definition should be inclusive and broad enough to, uh, to address the challenges and needs of the rural areas, um, which are very diverse. Um, the, as again said, the smart village strategies have a key role to play in this, and leader can be utilized to support these processes and provide a, a one-stop shop under their seven um, key objectives. Um, and just looking at some of the principles um, of the smart villages, they primarily begin with the local people coming together with a common problem or a common vision. Depending on the, 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 the local circumstances, these initiatives may prioritize economic, social and environmental issues um, and, and, or be a combination of all. Uh, motivation is absolutely key. And again, from the work that we found with uh, rural economies, that the, the motivation is massive down there. there there's a huge appetite to to, to really learn and grow and develop their areas. Um, it should go beyond isolated activities and be implemented through an integration of packages. And that will actually ensure greater integrated solidified results as opposed to individual one-off um, activities or opportunities. And digital and social innovation sits at the core of all this. So it's absolutely essential. Um, and there's just, I just provide you with the link there to the, um, to the Smart Villages portal. So, and, and it's a really, really, really useful resource in looking at um, and advancing these principles. So just to, to wrap up then, um, Smart Villages concept is closely aligned with the Ireland's new Smart Community Initiative, which was launched by the Department of Rural and Community Development and the Department of Community, Communications, Climate Action and Environment back in January of last year. 
The initiative is a new approach that would bring exposure to digital content and technology into the community and support the discovery of the value of digital technologies in the lives of daily people. Um, the Smart Community Action Group was established along with a pilot Smart Community Initiative in Tubbacurry, County Sligo as part of this Smart Community Initiative. And the Tubbacurry welcomed the, the Grow Remote Conference in uh, April of last year. This one day conference featured speakers from across Europe and the US and discussed the opportunities that exist for remote working in Ireland and the benefits that it can bring to employees, employers and the local communities. And there's no better time, as we all know, to talk about the opportunities and benefits of remote working. And just some points on the Sligo Smart Community um, and the four key pillars of it. So it's about physical and mental well-being, economic well-being, history and heritage, and basic digital skills. And I suppose at the center of this is the citizen, is the community, and the well-being of both. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, William, for uh, that, uh, the interesting presentation and the overview of all these different initiatives, also starting from the EU side and then zooming into uh, the, the, the programs in Ireland and in particular the one you just mentioned on the, on the end, the, the, the smart community in, in Sligo. I think there's so many initiatives yeah. around that. But as you said in your presentation, uh, it's uh, the people and the innovation and to really have an impact on a positive impact on, on the life uh, of, of people and the innovation and, and within the, the, the rural areas is so important. Uh, uh, around that, so particularly, like I'm, 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 I'm from a computing and and uh, technology side, so we often forget or we, we don't consider enough that that the, the impact what actually digitalization has. Uh, and the consideration in, in these communities, in these local uh, communities. So, so thanks for, for providing uh, that, that overview and all the insights in it. So I found uh, that the, in the beginning of the presentation, also the CSO, that the, the, um, the census information quite interesting, actually, yeah. with the, the, the different regions and particular contrasting them, for, for example, uh, a community in Dublin with someone, for example, in the west of Ireland. So yeah. this is really quite uh, fascinating uh, uh, around that. So, yeah. Thanks, yeah, and, on, and also that, that the COVID crisis, of course, on one side, uh, it, it helped us to accelerate digital transformation. But of course, on the other side, it also faces huge challenges around this. So I, I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, on the end in the, in the panel uh, session. So again, uh, to everyone, to the participants, if you have some questions, please put that into the Q&A uh, button there. And uh, then we can uh, discuss with William about the, the, the topics he presented. So, so thanks again from my side. Oh, thank you, Marcus. And then um, we move on to the third keynote uh, presentation um, within this um, webinar. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, uh, Michal uh, Ohanik, um, so uh, Chief Executive Officer from the uh, Galtag uh, Area the Digital Network, the, um, uh, in, in Ireland. So um, when I read this with uh, over 30 hubs, uh, different sizes, uh, it's, it's impressive and I'm looking forward uh, to, to your presentation and looking at also the, the, the strategies and the kind of the, the broader uh, view around all this net, the, the development of that network of the digital hub in the Galtech areas. And uh, so, so thanks, Michal, for taking the time. And now we try also the technical um, change uh, on the, the screen sharing. Hopefully that works with all the little technical uh, challenges what we had now in, in this webinar. So I apologize again for this, uh, mm -hmm. but hopefully uh, this works now. So, so far it works very well. So I see the presentation and uh, I be quiet now for a second. And yeah, if, if we hear you, Michal. Thank you very much, Marcus. And um, very glad to be with you this afternoon. Um, in terms of Uderas I'd just like to give you a little bit of background. I know people like Beatrice would be very familiar with the Geltet areas, especially in, um, in Mayo. But just to give a bit of background about the region that we're responsible for and the organization itself, um, you can see here um, that we actually cover parts of seven different counties in Ireland. Um, stretching from Donegal in the north to Cork across to Waterford, a very small part of County Meath as well. Um, we've got a dual role 
um, we've got an economic development role and in the context of the Geltacht, we actually carry out the roles of um, the IDA, Enterprise Ireland and the LEOs in Geltacht regions. Um, the Geltacht regions um, would have an overall population of around just over 100,000. Um, one thing I would say, uh, just uh, the point that William made there in terms of the disparity between rural areas, um, you know, even in a, a region such as the Geltacht, we have very, very big disparities in terms of, you know, the location, the peripherality and so on of these regions. Some of our regions border Galway City, some of our regions are offshore islands. Um, some of our regions are in West Connemara, the most have the highest unemployment rates in Ireland. So a very, very varied um, t region, um, even though we're linked um, through culture and language, which is uh, the reason for being there. So um, the other side of our brief is the preservation and promotion of the Irish language. So if you can see there, um, our job is to support economic development and job creation, to consolidate and to grow viable Celtic communities, and through that, to promote and grow Irish as a living community language. And that's the um, government policy that we were set up to, um, to be responsible for. Um, in, in terms of creating employment, we deal with some of the most peripheral areas in the country. Um, but I think it's very telling that, um, you know, businesses can and do thrive in these rural areas. And I know that um, the, our end of year figures this year are going to be interesting to look at. But, but if you look at um, maybe our last normal year of operation at the end of 2019, um, Uderos supported companies were providing 7,844 full-time jobs in various Celtic regions and 523 part-time jobs. And as well as that, um, just over 1,000 participants in employment schemes as well, which we administer. Um, we're involved in a wide range of sectors, um, just as a picture there, everything from full on jam to um, fun of lighthouse for tourism to the glass cutter there is actually, um, um, that, that was the bowl that the government brought over to Donald Trump there a couple of years ago. Um, we always get a smile when we look at him, I'm glad he didn't drop it. So. Um, and, but we have a wide variety of companies, and I just would emphasize, we deal with a very rural area, but we have very successful companies, some companies operating um, worldwide markets, world-class standards in these rural areas. And this just gives you an indication of some of the companies in the various, in the various counties. And again, I know Beatrice would recognize some of them from her own county. Um, I think it's very important as well in terms of the discussion about rural areas that very often it seems as though um, we in the west of Ireland and we in rural areas are constantly harping on about the lack of resources that we're getting um, that we want to put to use in developing our areas. But I think that this, um, this diagram here is, is, is interesting because if you take last year that, um, well, the majority of our companies would employ less than 10 people, um, independent figures, um, um, absentee figures, um, would, would show that our larger companies would have had total sales of 838 million last year, 496 million of that from these rural areas was, was exported, that's 59% of total sales, um, 430 million direct spend in the Irish economy, 184 million um, total payroll expenditure, and 77 million going back to the exchequer in various taxes. So I think it's very important always to emphasize that rural areas do pay their way and that um, there are benefits there that it's, um, that well, we have cultural benefits and societal benefits and so on. There are very real economic benefits if rural areas are, are supported. In terms of our strategic plan for 2018, 2020, um, we were working to have 1500 new jobs approved over the lifetime of the strategy to have 8,000 full-time jobs um, on the ground uh, in our company's full-time jobs at the end of 2020. And we were very much on target for that. And as I said earlier, it will be interesting to see how we figure out there. In terms of the um, language brief, a very important part of our brief is the preparation for the first time of language plans in, in um, association with local community groups. And 29 of those plans will have been um, prepared and approved by the department at the end of this year and implemented. It's a new approach by us. It's a bottom-up approach.
but um, we're trying to get in with community development and other developments there. And um, so far, we're delighted with the buy-in that we've received from the various communities. We support um, and subsidize 33 community development organizations. We provide them with um, administrative and management grants to help them function in all parts of the Delta. And they're very important. They're very important in the context of our digital network as well. And a very important part of our work is the consolidation of our Geltic brand, which is very important in, in terms of our outward facing um, nationally and, and, and internationally. Um, some of the key strategic projects that, that, that um, we had in our, in, in our um, three-year strategy taken us to the end of this year was the development of Park Namara, a marine innovation park in West, in West Connemara which is um, part of harnessing our ocean wealth, part of the national bioeconomy policy statement and so on. But I think it's, it's an example of harnessing what is a very important resource for the West of Ireland. And this it will be a marine innovation park, looking at research, looking at development, um, added value production and so on. And um, we've applied for planning permission for that at the moment, but it's envisaged that there'll be 300 direct and 400 indirect jobs on completion there based on the expressions of interest we have to locate there. The next is the one I want to talk a little bit more about um, in, in a few minutes is GTEC, um, our Geltic digital network. Um, the Geltic brand was a key part of what we wanted to do. The Geltic diaspora, reaching out to our global community is a very important part, as was um, the development of strategic tourism projects. Um, just on the Geltic brand, I think it, it was very important for us um, we have a very strong brand, but it was very important for us to find a way to reflect that and to, um, you know, even to develop a visual logo was a very important part of it. And uh, what we've had is that companies throughout the Delta, communities, artists, um, businesses of all types have taken on that brand. And it's very important for us uh, in terms of um, our getting our story out to the world so that brands is developed and consolidated. And again, the diaspora is very important for us. And um, we're using all means in, with the, in terms of social media and so on to connect. We've got a very strong, and I know that um, different counties within the Gelt areas are focusing on this. Um, and we're, we're, we're working very much in cooperation with the various counties. Um, but it is very important for us to tie into um, the very good connections we have there. If you take Mayor Marty Walsh there, he's been invaluable to us in developing um, third level and other um, research institute connections in New England for our marine innovation parks. So there, um, there are an awful lot of practical benefits there. Um, and just on the language planning areas, which I mentioned, very important part of our work that'll give you an indication of all the communities we're working in, and that's a picture would give you an indication. Um, I mentioned the 33 uh, community-based uh, organizations, mainly built up community co-ops that we support. This is a very important network for us. They're involved in a wide range of service provisions in their areas. They're involved in a wide range of developments. They're very, very much um, very important partners for us in um, delivering our strategy and very important part partners for us in de delivering our um, GTEC um, network strategy as well. And the Gelta Digital Network, um, we decided to develop this in order to um, to provide bases in the various rural Gelta areas, which would um, support entrepreneurship and enterprise development. Very much um, in our thoughts from the beginning, and it's become more topical than ever now, is the whole area of remote working and capitalizing on the advantages of the rural areas, the rural Gelta areas, um, the, many of the advantages that they have in common with other areas in terms of culture, language in our case, um, environment, safety, um, good schools, um, the quality of life in general, that we knew that we had that in abundance. But um, again, I, I, I was listening to Beatrice there, and in terms of the tech, new technologies we felt could level the playing field for us, that we always knew that we had these advantages, but um, we had many people that wanted to live in a place like Lidar, having to get on John McGinley's bus at five o'clock on a Monday morning and then arrive back on McGinley's bus in Lidar at one o'clock on, on, on the following um, um, Saturday morning. Um, so the, the opportunities for people to be able to work remotely 
and that was very much part of our thinking. Um, as well as that, if you look at our larger um, digital hubs, like the, the picture there of G Tech Door, which has 250 seats, that we felt that, um, again, in terms of, um, it's not just Dublin that's overheating, Letterkenny was overheating in terms of um, office space and so on, and people traveling into um, companies like Primerica, which employ 1,400 people there, and also Optum. And um, we put a proposition that, you know, we could provide part of that um, building to them. And initially, it was a case of um, people that were traveling in and out to Letterkenny every day that it was going to save them um, 10 hours a week uh, and all of the, the green impacts and so on. And it started off with a number of workers who had been commuting to Letterkenny from West Donegal starting there. But with the success of this, um, Primerica have actually started recruiting locally as well. So again, if 50 jobs in Gridor is as good, you know, as important as maybe I won't say 1,400 in Letterkenny, but it is very important. And um, it is a, a, a part of the GTEC um, model that while m many of our bases would be too small for that, um, it is an important part where in places like um, like Gidor, Spittle, Farbo, and places where, where we do have the capacity to take on um, a, 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 a significant enough numbers for companies to they wish to locate there. And also to be a base for innovation research um, that we that what we wanted to do was to tie in with um, partnerships with third level institutions and others and um, it ju just that we would have focal points where we could promote um, innovation, support research, um, just support local businesses, whether they're in the um, digital hubs themselves or in the, in the surrounding community. So um, at this stage, we're working towards a network of um, 30 plus um, digital and innovation hubs uh, being developed across the various Celtic regions. Now, they, they vary in size from Gridor, which has 250 seats to Karna, which has eight seats, um, but they're all part of the network. They're all tied in with each other, and um, we want to ensure that there's shared learning across. Um, so all, all of these areas, wherever they're located, are providing state-of-the-art modern office facilities with high-speed broadband connectivity, and as I said, supporting entrepreneurship, innovation, and remote working in the Delta. And um, through this, supporting sustainability of the Delta and the offshore islands, uh, by enabling companies and individuals to establish, um, to locate in the region or not having to leave the, leave the region. Uh, um, so um, the development and networking supports that are provided is that um, in terms of say uh, all of the users to ensure that um, this is a network, um, whether you're located in Donegal or whether you're in Bidor or um, Aran Moore Island or Cape Clear in Cork or Dingle or or um, or, or Karurua and Galway, um, just being connected. Um, that uh, you know, Ninyart Gharlekela, and um, and that connection and the shared learning is, is very important. And that's very much why we put a lot of time into promoting and supporting networking to create synergies, um, cooperation and collaborations. And I'm sure people that are involved in digital hubs will recognize that once you get people together, that these synergies do happen. You start getting people cooperating, you start getting people involved in collaborations, you start getting an awful lot of added value. And we're seeing that at a very early stage. Um, information events are very, are very important. If we're providing, um, you know, um, if we've got somebody that's able to, um, to come in, say to Encarurua, um, and share their experience and so on, I mean, that's broadcast and shared with all of the digital hubs, whether it be Bill Henry and Cork again or, or wherever. It's set. Um, and I suppose the thing is, is that all of the people that are located there can avail of the full range of supports from Mulderas and the Gelt in its, in its um, development agency role. And that would give you an indication of um, the, um, the network. Um, Many of these are already up and running. Many are in are in development. Um, we intend to have of the I say thirty plus. We're talking about a thirty two, but we're on schedule to have twenty seven of these operational by the end of this year, and the the others operational and um, early early next year. So this was from a standing start really um, three years ago, and we're uh, but there was big interest, and. 
in, ter in terms of this Uderos Nagelka that could not do this without the cooperation of local communities, and I mentioned their community co-op network there, um, we can and we have to provide managers and so on for the big digital hubs such as Guido or, you know, and Spigel, um, Furbo, and so on. But it would be impossible for us to provide the resource directly to manage all of these. So we've tapped into our community organization network. So if you take in Kiatrua, Korham and Victara, which is local community co-op, manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. And Ishmore is going to be managed by Korham and Arin, Kornomona by Korham and Duhi um, and, and, and so on. There's also other arrangements where in um, Belawared and in, um, in Kilkar, Westbeck actually, actually have taken on the, the, the role of managing them. So, but it is mainly through community management and tying in with local communities. And that makes it feasible for us to do it um, because otherwise, uh, you know, you can see the scale of it would just be too much. But um, as I say, we have got that, we've got that buy-in, but that, that, as well as um, the um, local expertise and the resource of having people um, being available to run this for you, the buy-in and the local ownership is very important for us as well. And that's something that, that we've seen. And that's just the next slide here gives you an indication of some of the partners that we have working with us on this. Um, Korchum and Musgri managed the one in Belangheri. Um, my interest to get the educational project um, managed the one in Chirinia and Connemara. Um, um, Barbara. Achul um, Akal, the um, arrangements being put in place for the um, Akal Community Co-op to um, to uh, manage the digital hub, which is just about to open there, and it's see Westbeck there, and so on. So there is a very thing, and it is a very very um, good partnership. What we're finding is that Gelt people are returning home to um, to work remotely. Um, you know, it was very interesting to see uh, this, the initial people coming along saying how they have persuaded their, um, their, their, their managers, their bosses, whether it be in Dublin or London, um, to, to, to let them return to places like Carrigarsh and Donegal and, and, um, and work. And, and, you know, it was succeeding for some people. I think um, I heard it mentioned just there earlier on. I think that, um, that the, 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 the um, it, present crisis, I think, has kind of uh, fast-tracked and proved that model, I think. And I think that um, if very little good is going to come out of the present crisis, but I think it's going to be beneficial and, and that it's proved that people can work effectively um, from remote areas. And I think it's also going to be very beneficial for digital hubs because it's not just about working from home. I think it's very important that people have these centers, they might want to work from home some days or most days or the odd day, but I think it's very, very important to have these um, centers where you have that, you know, um, social aspect where you have the, the synergies I mentioned earlier on and so on, um, and, that, and, and just to combat isolation. So I think that these will be a key part of the model of, of, of remote working for rural areas going forward. Um, and again, We've seen the opportunity to attract high tech companies to Gelt. That we've got companies like Primerica and Optum that now have presences in in, in places like Eidora that they wouldn't have um, before. And we're also finding that um, you know just on that 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 more companies are inquiring about about the availability of space and and, and so on. So it is an aspect that 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 we want to that we want to advance um, in terms of the. Um, I mentioned there that we have um, an awful lot of businesses operating in Delta areas. Um, I think w another thing on that, just in terms of um, uh, you know fast tracking and proving the model and so on, is that since 2017, we have, in common with the Leos throughout the country, have had a scheme we call it Trada Lerlina um, Trading Online, and uh, we launched that in early 2017. And I, I suppose. Um, to say that it wasn't, it didn't catch people's imagination would be putting it mildly. I think that um, since early 2017, I think we had um, 20 approvals and about 10 companies taken it up. But um, in the past three months, we've had um, 218 companies 
come to us to avail of, of that program um, and seeing the importance and the benefits of having an online presence and being able to um, have online activity. So, um, so, so the, the, it's something that's really been accelerated and I think it's something that's going to be of ongoing benefit for rural areas um, as, as we go forward. Um, one of the um, projects that we're building around this is um, a, a European project called Digi the Market. It's being led by our Bell Mullet office actually, um, but um, it, it's a European program that's based around um, the, the, the um, GTEC network and um, looking at things like use of immersive technologies, the development of a marketing toolkit, um, building a business business digital city to create virtual, um, virtual networks and creating green framework to help um, uh, people move towards sustainable practices, certifications and so on. So I think this is an example just of a, a European program which, um, which is a, a, a helping us to consolidate and, and, and to increase the learning based around a digital network. And um, it's just pictures of some of the, some of the um, digital network, uh, digital hubs that we have in different places there and so on. So I'd say that, um, that hopefully would give you an indication of what we're trying to do. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's was very much part of our strategy from 2018 to 2020. I think now that we have the physical network in place, we're working to see how we can optimize that physical network in terms of um, supporting the digital economy and, and, um, and, and related aspects going forward. It's going to be a very, a very important part of our, what's going to be a five-year strategy going on from 2021. Um, so, um, so with that, maybe I'll just leave it at that. And thanks for your attention there. Um, thanks, Michal, for this uh, impressive and, and really insightful presentation about all the initiatives about uh, the, the digital network, the GTEC, and all this. So certainly I wasn't aware about the scale and the, uh, the amount uh, in, in the GELTEC areas around the digital network and the digital hub. So uh, thanks for sharing this. And also, I think, um, as you mentioned, uh, so the economic aspects are important so that people can live and work and also bring an income and an economic growth in the rural area. But you also uh, pointed out the social aspects of this so that they have a place where they can go and actually socialize and, and discuss to reveal all of these opportunities around innovation. I think also this is extremely important to share the ideas, to communicate. And I think all of us over the last two, three months with the COVID crisis realized how important actually the the social aspect is as well so we can do a lot online and in digital and remote working and all this but we also need places where we actually can share and discuss ideas and so I believe these hubs and and the community aspect is extremely important uh, around that if you really want to make digital working and particularly in the remote areas and and in that concept what we now discussed and, and presented uh, in, in uh, this afternoon. So um, thanks again, Miha, for, for this. So, um, uh, and I think uh, actually one point what you mentioned as well, we make the, the plain field, the kind of the similar than the, than the, the big centers, the, the big cities, and we can do something similar in the remote area. So I found it quite interesting that actually people from uh, London or the UK moved to uh, the remote areas and can work from there. So this is a really nice and welcoming uh, development. Um, so um, before we move to the question and uh, answer the discussion around that, so we also try to get that video maybe uh, uh, going from what Beatrice on the beginning um, wanted to show. Faced on certain terrain, but adrift in the storm. It feels like you're a million miles away. I'm in Paris. Currently living in Vancouver. In Dubai, Chicago, in Hong Kong, sorry, in the UK. Clamour, the reservation. Working from home. Things are very strange at the moment. I haven't seen my mother in a, in a while. You miss seeing family and friends. It's really tough to be here. And them no matter how long you're gone, we've just got to do it together. It'll always be home.
We have two sons in Australia. And now a grandson. He had missed them around the place. It's sad to not be able to get together and play music. They're more than just my friends. They're my family here in Ireland. The airport will suspend operations from next Monday. All flights to and from Ireland. We've West never had to close before to see the place so quiet. It's gutting, to be honest. We may fall. We've faced challenges before. It is extremely important for us to do everything that we can. We all need to play our part to fight the virus. We all will be standing to tough times on fire. Every hour in this world, we'll get through this. Hope is always on the horizon. When I'm looking for inspiration, generation that built the airport, they said it couldn't happen, couldn't be done. And it was done. Home has never been closer than it is now. You're never as far away as you think you are. We might be playing a part. But it brings us together in spirit. It's important you remember where you came from. How far away you are, you still feel connected. People in Mayo do, it helps each other. Togetherness. Home means more. And it makes my day when I get to call home. It strengthens our sense of belonging. I always had tremendous pride in where I came from. We may be oceans of power, but never in spirit. Hope is always on the horizon. Doing together more than we can do by ourselves. But when the storm settles, and the storm will settle, we'll see you again. Thanks, and thanks, Beatrice, for sharing that, that, that it worked now. And uh, I think it resonates to many of us, now, particularly the ones who like uh, worked remote and um, couldn't travel coming back home. So it, it's really uh, like, a, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. So, um, and I think it also shows what digitalization can do. So we can work from remote and we can have a webinar uh, international. So I just looked a little bit through the participants list in, in this webinar as well. So we have uh, participants, uh, international participants as well. So I think this is all possible, but on the other side, we also need a grounding somewhere in communities and uh, that, that social aspect, I think, came through all the three presentations as well out that this is uh, extremely important, the connectivity in technical sense that it works, but also I think in the social sense to have that connectivity and, and I would call it social grounding and, and the local aspects uh, as well, in particular in the rural community where they have these advantages of the, the closeness and the innovation and, and all of this. And I think that's really one of the first fantastic um, message as well that basically um, uh, benefiting from these advantages, the cultural, the, the, the social aspects, and using that also for innovation and economic growth that benefits the, 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 the local areas. So um, I would like to move now to, I, I know we're learning a little bit late, but I think we should take the time um, from the networking session for the question and answer for the panel session. Uh, and I think Saul joined as well again, so I, I don't know if it works now, but uh, so that was uh, the intention at least that we have now two facilitators as well. So I don't know if you... If it yeah, works. Hopefully it works. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, I would like to say my thanks to three of our uh, speakers, professionals, and just in summary, thanks to Beatrice to talk about uh, making the rural areas vibrant, vibrant through digitalization. And also thanks to 
um, William, who talked about the importance of the uh, societal, economical, and also sustainable growth in the rural area, the barriers, and also the implication. Also, thanks to uh, Michal, who talked about the uh, digital hubs, hubs all across the um, and technology hubs across the different countries in Ireland uh, to uh, enhance the growth, economical growth in the rural areas. That was really all interesting. Thanks to all. And in relation to your um, presentation and uh, speaks, we had uh, uh, received three questions and we are going to go through. The first question is to the panel, to all, and I would like to ask you, please answer um, uh, each of you or three of you, thanks to, for that. The first question for the panel is that there is a huge gap between rural and or, uh, urban and are we being ambitious enough in these initiatives? That's the question from Roger. Um, uh, Beatrice, would you like to start? Yeah, certainly, Zara. Thank you, Roger, for, for the question. Um, honestly, my answer is probably no. I, I think we can never do enough. Um, you know, there is rural, urban, um, you know, city, rural. It's, um, I think we, we've all shown the potential of, of the, the rural areas, you know, I mean, what Michal has shown there with the, the, the enterprise hubs and the digital hubs um, is, is just amazing. Um, how, how do we go about, you know, bringing more attention to that? Um, our politicians are certainly people that, that we can lobby and speak to. Um, I mean, we have, a, where I'm sitting at the moment in, in Westport, in the west of Ireland, uh, we have a very, very strong uh, local politician here, um, Michael Ring, is the, the Minister for, for uh, the Rural and Community side of things. Um, so he's certainly doing his part. Um, but, but, but I think we can always do more. Um, how we do that, maybe a bit more joined up thinking. And I think we have a lot of very good agencies, uh, perhaps a little bit more coordination between them uh, to lobby collectively on all of our behalf. So I think that's, that's my answer to that. Thanks, Beatrice. Michal, would you like to answer this question too? Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think that um, we can never be too ambitious. Um, and I do think that um, Beatrice mentioned Minister Ring there. Uh, the Rural re um, Regeneration Scheme was absolutely key to our being able to fast track our um, digital network. That um, three and a half million of, of um, the RRDF has gone into um, developing digital hubs in the Gaeltacht in the past two years. So that type of resourcing of rural initiatives is absolutely vital. I mean, there's no doubt if you just take um, our, our own strategy, and I, and I know that this this goes for all parts, uh, you know, of, of the Western Seaboard. Anyway, we've identified the very real resources that exist in these areas, in terms of marine resources, tourism resources, the opportunities for the green economy and renewable energy, and um, things like the digital, digital network that I mentioned there. So I do think that um, there's no lack of ambition. I think that um, one thing we spend an awful lot of our time um, seeking the necessary resources to fulfill that ambition. But I do definitely think that um, the resources are there. The resources are unique. What we want to do in the Marine Innovation Park in West Galway, you can't do on the East Coast. You can't do in the middle of the country. You can't do in Dublin. But you can do it in a rural part of Ireland. So I think that um, we need to continue working to identify the opportunities as well as the needs and to continue to seek to get the necessary investment to advance these um, in a sustainable way. So um, I don't think there's lack of ambition, but I do think that um, we are running a bit behind in terms of resources. And I just hope that um, we don't get too much uh, of, you know, that, that the effects of the present emergency, um, you know, don't place another drag on the necessary development of rural areas. Thanks, Michal. And William? Do you like to answer this question too? Yeah, sure. Like I agree with both what Michal and Beatrice are saying. And just, just to add, say, another dimension to it is that um, in terms of being even more ambitious, <clears throat> and even this is just to practical personal experience within the business sense, 
there's a great opportunity and appetite um, to engage, uh, collaborate, network internationally, both in Europe and beyond. And um, I just I just know from the work we've done that 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 their uh, overseas um, networking partners um, are are so willing to help, assist, direct, guide. You know, in, in best practice, in greater opportunities, engaging in what. They, they've been doing so there's a huge there's a huge opportunity there for us and also there's a huge appetite from overseas to really help us you know in advancing you know what I mean I think you, you, you can never underestimate that um, level of you know engagement and collaboration to, to really bring, bring us all forward you know what I mean in terms of innovation and advancement okay uh, thanks William for the answer and uh, we are going to the next uh, question, which is coming from Domenico Telgo, uh, Tegolo. We know Domenico from the recent proposal that we have been working an innovation action proposal related to boosting the rural area. And there is a question from his side. He is asking that each field of action, um, profit and nonprofit organization, they have their own skills, languages, and needs. And the question is that how can they be in, uh, integrated into a common and equal growth strategy? This is first question of him. And then he's asking, is the solution to a global context data analysis, uh, analysis approach to preventing the needs? Um, Beatrice, do you like to answer this question? Yeah, sure, Vera. Um, yeah, I think actually it kind of goes to the whole theme of what we're talking about today, you know, that digital ecosystem and, you know, how we join things up and to go out there and evaluate and, and define exactly what it is and, and what who are a part and, and what is that ecosystem, I think is important. Um, that then, you know, allows us to go forward because there are there are things that we know about. There's very obvious things the the AC, you know, Udras, um, the Western Development Commission, the AEC, the Smart Atlantic Way. So there are a lot of entities that are known, but there are probably some unknowns. And I, I think that, you know, um, whether it be industry, small community groups, that, that there's a lot of value out there that can be tapped. Um, as far as data, I mean, that's that's close to my heart. I think that um, absolutely there are ways of pulling data together you know there are probably data that local authorities manage and not own as such you know but data that could potentially be shared obviously not data that has personal information but you know maybe some economic data and, and that's all about open data and making that data available um, externally and joining up all that data as well to analyze and and define what where it is we want to go so yeah thanks Laura. thanks Beatrice and William uh, do you want to answer this question? We cannot hear you, William. Uh, apologies. Um, as as Beatrice was saying, yeah, like the the look, looking at the opportunities, the globalization um, uh, issues, um, like the the trends that are happening, and I touched on some of them in my presentation. The the, the, the global trends that are happening are, are not just you know, happening overseas, they're happening here as well. And, and we can absolutely, you know, align very well with those and respond accordingly. You know what I mean? So the same issues that are happening here in rural economies are happening all over uh, Europe and beyond. And that alignment integration is very important. And data, as, 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 as I said at the start of my presentation about FAC, d data is absolutely critical because d data allows you make evidence-based decisions and policy formulation from it. And it's, it's so important. And the sharing of that data for the betterment of all is so important. You know what I mean? Um, uh, obviously, as Beatrice said, you know, personalized data, you know, is one thing and, and, that, and that can be kept out of the, of the um, analysis, but just, just the, the generality, the, you know, the, the aggregated up data, where you can really get kind of um, really good insights and, and really kind of formulate um, you know, key directions and decisions is really important. And, and also I can't, again, uh, uh, stress enough the importance of engagement with, with stakeholders, with community, with citizen in, in different types of open forum, be it online surveys, collaborative platforms, you know, um, drop-in workshops, you know, and, and get, 
their information and their knowledge of the area in terms of qualitative and quantitative data is really, really important. Uh, thanks, Billy. And Michal, do you like to answer this question too? Yeah, just to say that in terms of um, the importance of having a coordinated approach and um, an integrated approach uh, is very important. Um, the sharing of information, uh, you know, is absolutely vital to be able to do evidence-based planning. I think that an awful lot of advances have been made um, in, you know, in, in recent well, in recent decades with the um, the county development board approach, which which unfortunately um, is hasn't continued as such. But I think that um, the fact that you know it was people realized that kind of there was, a, you know, a common you know vision that we needed to have for our, our areas um, and that we needed to have a joined up approach to actually um, you know achieving aims and objectives for these areas economic social cultural um, it, there are an awful lot of resources there on the ground and it is absolutely vital to ensure that um, that there's two ways it's access that, that agencies like ourselves have access um, to, to the many resources on the ground and that they have access uh, to, the, to the agencies. Um, again, in terms of the information sharing, well, you know, the safeguards are absolutely vital. Um, over the years, I think it's fair to say that there have been an awful lot of blockages about things maybe where safeguards wouldn't be that, um, that, 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 that critical to them, that um, there's been an awful lot of duplication and an awful lot of non-sharing of information, which is basically led to, you know, reinventing the wheel and, 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 and a drag on resources. But, 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 um, but very, very definitely, I do think that um, um, in, compared to 20 years ago, I think we are going in the right direction. There's still a, lot way to, a long way to go, but, um, but I do think advances have been made. Uh, thanks, Michal, for the answer. And uh, now we have another question. Uh, so, sorry, so, so I think um, so what I would suggest, because like there are so many questions now in, in, in written form, so I would like to actually summarize and maybe putting three questions in, in one. I'm trying that at least. So uh, it was kind of around uh, how the DISFOA can actually be involved in, uh, in the education links in economic development. So how can we actually avail of that wider network around it? And then there was a question also, and I think that's very related of how can we involve um, uh, village dwellers, so the village community actually in decision making, should they be involved? And uh, like I know it from, from our own experience, like it's only a certain percentage or a certain uh, part of the population communities which are basically part of this decision making and so um, uh, should we facilitate, encourage, how do we do that? So all around kind of engagement and involving people and uh, the third question that was specifically to Beatrice around enterprise architecture and how that thing, so my kind of thing is, so does that actually help to involve someone or is it so much something very disconnected from it? Is it something technical or is it all about engagement uh, and, and how to really utilize the ideas, but also in, uh, involve um, 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 uh, the village, the communities in decision making. So I don't know who wants to actually start with it. So uh, uh, um, if someone um, wants to have a comment on it, so. Yeah, I can, I can take that, Marcus. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a good bit there, you know, and, and I think it's um, the question around the, uh, the consultation and uh, engagement with citizen is huge. And we're probably a bit guilty of, um, you know, well, firstly, we haven't had the online platforms up to now, you know, we will have that platform going live. And the initial focus is towards our statutory obligations, so our local development plan and so forth. But maybe there's an opportunity beyond that, you know, to consult um, with citizens. And that's a fantastic platform. I mean, it allows you to engage with particular aspects of a plan. Um, there's a mapping integration with our mapping platform uh, with ArcGIS. Um, so, so it's a very, you know, user-friendly and powerful platform. Um, what we did also when we were designing our website, we had a lot of engagement and we had engagement with community groups and uh, actually the diaspora, you know, because they are very important to us in Mayo, as I said, with our three and a half million people identifying with, with Mayo roots. Um, so we did, you know, we reached out to them also 
and there are a lot of opportunities because you know there are people that are temporarily abroad and coming back but there are also a lot of business opportunities you know people that want to invest and and you know give something back to where their roots were i, th I think you have that aspect as well um but yeah so um and um you know i know the, when it came to enterprise architecture there probably could be a whole session on that <laughs> and you know from a smart city smart region aspect of enterprise architecture i mean that's an area that Manus are hugely engaged in and Nozora, that's that's your particular expertise um but there are many ways i mean there there's a lot you can adapt from your business enterprise architecture to a smart city and extend beyond that so there are tools there are methods uh, there are frameworks um so there, there are a lot of things we can do in that regard Okay. Thanks. I, I know it was a challenging thing to put enterprise architecture in that question as well, but I was interested in, in that because I think actually enterprise architecture with their service and end user and citizen orientation has a lot also to offer with that engagement and understanding actually around the needs. So uh, that's kind of so also why I, why I thought this fits together. So William Mihol, do you have any comments on, on involving um, people engagement? We can't hear you, at least I can't hear you. Hello, is that, is, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just, just in terms of um, the community engagement aspect, I, I mentioned the importance of the community co-op model, which is, isn't just co-ops, it's other types of community entities. But, um, but it's absolutely vital that that gives us the link directly into the community, a two-way link, which is absolutely vital in the preparation and in the implementation of our strategies and, um, and the broader counties that we work in over the years, things such as the community fora and the um, participatory, participatory networks are also very important. Um, so we do place a very big um, emphasis on the participative elements of, 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 of local democracy, um, as well as working closely with, with local um, representatives and so on. So it is absolutely vital in terms of ensuring that um, the, you know, our strategies and, and our plans and our use of resources are, are, are what best can, can benefit the communities. Um, the diaspora is really central to us because I, I know that Mayo are very, very proactive in that. And I was actually in Cleveland and I actually saw firsthand the real resource that, that, that's out there. But um, in a previous existence in Donegal, we would have had it as a key part of our strategy. And now in, in the Gaeltacht, because there's no doubt about it, there is a virtual community out there. Uh, and the um, existence of the new technologies makes that a lot more instantly accessible than it was. We still have the face-to-face -face engagement, and that's very important, but we can have daily engagement now in a very real way with people in all parts of the world who have an interest or some type of connection with us. And that doesn't always have to lead to investment. It can be providing us, as Mayor Walsh did, with vital contacts. It can be um, giving us access to skills. It can be attracting people back to visit you know, their areas and to, and to support the economy that way. And also in terms of engaging with the culture and so on. So I, I can't overemphasize the importance of diaspora in our existing and future strategies. Um, it's a very global world. Um, we're a very small spot in it, but we do have a very um, far reach and a very influential reach if we connect and we maintain, the, make the connection and maintain that connection. And yeah. can you just add to that, Marcus? Yeah. Uh, and I see there's a question there. I think it's related um, how, how village dwellers um, can and should be involved in the decision making about their towns. Um, one, one, one great initiative that, that's come from the UK, um, and it's primarily been about the town, but it can very easily be transferable into rural villages, is the whole initiative of the town teams. So that's T E A M S. Um, and like it's, we, we have um, set up in our work a number of town teams around the country and the, you can get really enthusiastic um, uh, community participants in that. Um, and, and the key to it is you bring um, 
local experts in that ha have different skill sets um, uh, and that they can really add to, to, to the discussion and to the initiatives and to the problem solving. And the other thing to add to that is that, that the town team needs to be um, very dynamic. So it, it, one should only sit on a town team for a maximum of three years. So, so you're getting this co constant um, refreshing and invigoration of the of the committee, and everyone then gets a chance to to um, in, instill their views and their knowledge, um, and also the town teams reach out to the community very very often, and the, and the more active we are, the more successful will be your will be your settlement. Uh, thanks. I think this is also a key challenge that refreshing, that agility, flexibility kind of coming back to it. At the same time, basically providing resilience and also structure and not kind of uh, flexibility in all the ways. So it's basically kind of really balancing that. Uh, so uh, the, 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 um, the, the rural structure and the communities with the flexibility, the agility and that refreshing. So I think that that's uh, really also shows that balancing act and the, 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 the challenge uh, around that. So I just looked at the time a little bit. So I said that one of my main jobs should be monitoring the time. I know we are already 15 minutes into that networking uh, session, but I thought uh, the discussion and the panel and uh, the, the discussion of the topic is very valuable and, and quite, quite insightful and interesting. So I didn't want to take that away. Uh, but so I think we should um, come to an end to, to from, from that of the, the official part of the panel and the presentation. I have one more question, so we are not finished yet. So <laughs> I, like a, sh a, a question with a short answer. So hopefully like that's kind of, we will, we will manage that. But I also think um, that topic is, is just kind of on the, the really becoming uh, really very important and, and this is already important, but very, with the benefits and all this. So we have set the foundation now, I think with the hubs, with the digitalization, but now to make it real working, maximizing, making these vibrant uh, rural areas, smart villages, ecosystems, that it works for everyone. And I think one of the things what I took from today is as well, we need to recognize the diversity in these rural areas. So. Um, we, we, we often apply a, a similar approach to many areas, but I think also from the, the three presentation, it came also like the diversity is important, the cultural uh, uh, heritage and, and the, the rural structure, the communities, which are quite diverse, are important. And we need to find a way to recognize and build that in uh, into that kind of standardization on digital hubs and technology standardization. So that will be a challenge, I think, um, for the coming um, uh, years uh, uh, and, and making that work for everyone to impact in a positive sense um, uh, the, the, the lives of everyone and uh, that basically that we can uh, live in the, that nice area like Beatrice, you had uh, nice, nice photos from the west of Ireland so that we can live in the rural area and uh, still have an economic growth around it. So my last question is, and it's related to one of the questions in, in the, the panel was around the government and the priorities and with the budget cuts and all this. So uh, to make it a little bit shorter, the answer, I thought about, I know it's only June or end of June, it's not Christmas yet, uh, but if it would be Christmas and you have a, a wish, like a, one wish to the government or to somewhere where we can change something, what would that be? to make this kind of uh, smart village, what we discussed now, really a bit uh, faster, better. Uh, so what would be the kind of the wish uh, then we basically would, we, would, could we change or what should be to happen to actually accelerate that, what we discussed uh, around that. And just like one, one point I think is enough. Like I tell that usually my kids don't make the wish list too long because then it's uh, like, it's, it's very difficult to prioritize. So one wish list, I one wish is probably sufficient. So I don't know, um, uh, William, you are just here on the, the, at least on my screen sure. in the middle here. So maybe we start with, uh, with your wish, uh, what, uh, what for the smart village, uh, acceleration or so i i think um to invigorate the, the villages is to to, to really uh, allow the continuation of the say funding supports be it under the the, the rural regeneration or others but really ha have that embedded and that is a constant over the next number of years and that and that the, you can have the calls um more frequent so you're not waiting for you know these long periods of time you know what I mean because it's like w w it takes time to to immobilize but then you may miss 
an opportunity by a couple of weeks or a month. But so I think if you can have those fundings more constant and more permanent, it would be really give um, you know comfort and support to the to the local communities. Thanks. That's that's a good wish, um, Beatrice. Yeah, um, I suppose the, the thing that's been crossing my mind a lot lately, Marcus, and in the context of, as you say, you know, what we've gone through, and it's very much something that Michal focused on in his presentation, and that is the enterprise hubs and the digital hubs, um, because I think that they're the game changer. You know, when, when we think about, and you hear Facebook talking about this in the United States, that now that their workforce, you know, pool is anywhere, and, and that applies globally as well. So I think that to leverage that opportunity, um, we walk down through some of our local towns and villages and we see closed up shops and premises. Um, there is a great example, a colleague of mine in, in, in Steinman, um, that Michal is probably familiar with, that uh, they've taken over a whole building and, and put in digital hubs and of all scale and to support individuals or small businesses. And I, I just think that there's fantastic opportunity there. And there is a lot of joined up thinking going on in that space. And uh, again, a, a former colleague, Stephen Carlin in the Western Development Commission is doing a lot of work in that space. So I think that is, that's an area of great opportunity. Okay, thanks Beatrice. Miho? Yeah, yeah and, and ju just uh, since it is a wish, um, um, well, wanting to continue with the excellent, you know, town and village and RRDF, um, say hard supports that are there. I, I think what would really make this work would be to look at the more soft supports and to realize that they're very important in terms of having resource persons in there to work with the communities to enable them to maximize the potential of this and to engage in local animation and capacity building. So if, if I did have one wish, I, I, I'd say, let, let's look at the value of the soft supports to back, to back this up. Thanks. That's also a fantastic wish. So I think if these three wishes would actually happen, so then it, it actually we could accelerate uh, that uh, smart village and the rural area uh, development. And I think one of the things is also like we have quite a number of people on that call. So to actually tell that message and um, so basically connecting and also uh, working on, on this vision for a vibrant rural uh, area and that economic growth. Uh, and basically on the beginning, I, I had some figures and I think we had some other statistics around that on the digital divide, the, the differences between rural area, uh, um, uh, urban areas and all this. And I think at least we can uh, reduce it, but actually also maybe making uh, the rural area a model or maybe a, a really beneficial model to, to live, work and uh, have economic growth in there because I, I fully believe it's, uh, it's a lot to the key challenges on environmental pollution uh, or the social challenges around this that the rural area has so much to, to offer if we do it in the right way. So hopefully these, these wishes come uh, will be here somewhere uh, and so we do our, our bit from the Manuf University and Innovation Value Institute to work on this so uh, uh, rural development digital transformation is one of the key topics uh, uh, from the Innovation Value Institute uh, so um, we are interested to continue the dialogue so we have two opportunities now one we try with the networking event so I will send in a second um, the, the, the Paul actually did already the, the, the link for the networking event so you can join that uh, and, and network but also if you want to engage in a discussion around collaboration work around digital transformation digital up um, and and particular now uh, smart villages um, uh, that that would be of course contact me or uh, sorry or someone from IVI um, I'm happy to discuss that further and I, I believe there are so many opportunities if we do it right and if it's a mix between technology community social aspects uh, again so if we would have now the physical uh, space we would basically put the hand together and applause for and thanks to the the three speakers so I do that verbally now so thanks again um, for sharing the insights and the presentation and uh, spending a whole afternoon virtually in that webinar. Um, so really greatly appreciate it. And I learned a lot about Ireland. I learned a lot about digitalization. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's lots of opportunities. So I'm looking forward to the next phase of uh, digitalization, rural areas and making these vibrant uh, smart villages. So thanks again. Thanks very much. Thank you.
And so now we can close this. So you see the link in, in, in the chat for everyone. If you want to, if you want to join the, the networking session, feel free to, to link to that. Uh, but from now the official part of, of that the webinar is finished. So the, the slides and also the, the recording will be shared afterwards. Um, so, and thanks for all the attendees uh, for staying the whole afternoon uh, with the webinar and again for the keynote speakers. Thank you.